Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi semuanya. Uh, sebelumnya saya mau mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Saiko. Uh, uh, thank you for Mission Tuning and Mission Link. Uh, telah bergabung di uh, kuliah umum metabolik dan sudah bersedia untuk mengisi untuk kuliah umum metabolik hari ini. Uh, jadi Bapak Ibu hari ini kita akan uh, ujian kompetitif. Uh, uh, kuliah umum metabolik seri ke 35 uh, dengan judul uh, High School Food Label Free uh, Proteomics with Healthy Diet. Uh, jadi Bapak Ibu uh, untuk uh, sebelum acara ini kita mulai mohon Bapak Ibu dapat tuliskan uh, nama dan juga instansi misalnya dari mana boleh di kolom chat ataupun di uh, nama di uh, Zoom ya Bapak dan Ibu. Uh, kemudian nanti kalau ada pertanyaan boleh juga dituliskan di kolom chat selama narasumber kita memberikan uh, materi. Uh, untuk selanjutnya uh, kegiatan kuliah umum metabolomik akan dipandu uh, oleh moderator kita hari ini yaitu Bapak kepada Pak Eko, kami persilakan Mas. Baik, terima kasih banyak uh, Ibu Dewi. Um, senang sekali dan kami berbagai sekali dapat uh, berjumpa secara de uh, online atau daring kepada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian untuk terus serta uh, memeriahkan uh, Forum Metabolik Indonesia dengan sesi um, sharing materi dari para ekspor yang pada hari ini um, kita ada ekspor um, pemateri dari uh, Waters Corporation. Perkenalkan sebelumnya, nama saya Arjuno Eko Putro. Saya biasa dipanggil Eko, nama tengah saya. Um, kemudian saya um, adalah Business Development Manager dari PT Kromtekindo Utama. Jadi perusahaan kami ini adalah uh, sole agent atau sole distributor di Indonesia untuk uh, produk dari Waters. Uh, selamat pagi Bapak dan Ibu sekalian para peserta uh, kuliah umum metabolomik ke-35 yang diselenggarakan oleh Forum Metabolomik Indonesia. And welcome to our speakers, Yan Ting Lim and Yin Ling from Waters Corporation. Sebelum kita memulai acara pada kesempatan pagi hari ini, ada baiknya saya bacakan profil singkat dari kedua pemateri kita pada hari ini. Yang pertama adalah Yanting Lim, PhD. Yanting is the market development manager in Southeast Asia for biopharmaceuticals and biomedical research. She is a business developer with strong scientific experiences. Prior to joining Waters, She was a research fellow at Nanyang Technological University and a star with a focus on proteomics and cellular thermal sieve assay or SETSA. Uh, she holds a PhD from NUS Graduate School for Integrated Sciences and Engineering, Biomedical Research under the Immunology Program. Our second speaker is Yan, uh, Yin Ling uh, Chow. Yinling is the chemistry specialist from Water Specific. She provides technical support on water chemistry products and is responsible for developing strategic and localized applications to address Southeast Asia market needs. Yinling earned her BSc, a degree from National University of Singapore in 2014 before joining Waters. She was an LCMS application for seven years where she provided support on HPLC, LCMS, and Malditov to both external and internal customers in Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia region. Baik, Bapak Ibu sekalian, tentunya kita tidak uh, sudah tidak sabar lagi untuk mendengarkan paparan dari kedua pemateri yang sudah siap berbagi tentunya. Sebelum dimulai, uh, kami perlu juga sampaikan uh, beberapa hal penting dalam webinar kita pada hari ini uh, selama berjalannya acara. Yang pertama uh, ada sesi tanya jawab peserta yang ingin mengajukan pertanyaan atau sharing silakan bisa mengajukan pertanyaannya atau komentarnya pada kolom uh, chat atau Q&A. 
Dan uh, mohon kiranya uh, pada akhir slide dari Yanting nanti, uh, Bapak, dan Ibu, Bapak dan Ibu berkenan untuk mengisi survei yang tersedia dalam bentuk QR Code uh, pada uh, slide terakhir dari pemateri. Alright, so without further ado, Yanting and Yinling, are you ready to share? Yes. Alright, very good. The screen is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Echo, so much. I will share the screen. And I just want to verify if you can see it. Yes, Yanting. And that you can hear me well? Yes, very Thank good. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to say in the middle of the presentation, we do have a video and I should have enabled just as an insurance. I will share one more time and I'm sharing sound. Now in the middle, if the video doesn't play the sound, please let me know and we'll do it one more time. So thank you so much. So here I am, I'm Yen Ting. Thank you for your 45 minutes this morning to come and listen to us together with Chrome Tech to um, share with you a little bit in this episode series 35, um, a suggestion on how you can start on label-free proteomics quantification in a high throughput manner. So I will begin uh, an overview, giving you the broad concepts about what it means to perform label-free proteomics. I will show you the instruments that you will require for these processes. And in the middle, Yin Ling, my colleague, will tell you a little bit more about the sample preparation in a high throughput manner, because of course, that's often a bottleneck that we should seriously consider. And finally, I will show you how you can possibly process this data after you have acquired it on your instruments. So first I want to share with you how you can extend your proteomic coverage and quantification precision with what we call data independent acquisition. But first on the subject of proteomics. So we have the metabolome, the proteome, the lipidome. So the proteomic aspect of this exercise is just simply a large scale study of the proteome. There's many sub-questions to this topic. Where are the proteins? How are they produced? How are they modified? How do they interact with each other? Now, if you are looking at what is the identity of the protein, for example, you have a cell line and you introduce some change to the gene and you want to know what's the consequence. For example, you want to study a protein that is uh, playing a role in cancer. You add it in and you want to see what are the domino effect on the proteome itself. Now then, proteomics can help you by simply determining what's the sequence, identification, how high and how low as a consequence of this change. Now, the other subject, which is more looking at the intact protein, its structure, its interaction, is also super interesting, but it's not the subject of this episode 35 today. We are going to talk about specifically shotgun, bottom-up, proteomics. What does that mean? You have a lot of proteins. An average cell has maybe 10,000 proteins. You're going to chew it up with trypsin in a predictable way. Trypsin will cleave all the proteins, leaving each peptide behind with a lysine or an arginine residue at the end, at the carboxylic acid terminus. Mm -hmm. as you can see in the diagram with the scissors. And so what this does is that you have to unravel the protein like noodles in soup, so that's denaturation, and the enzyme that will cut it to give you the pieces. And all these pieces, you shoot it in the MS. That's why the idea of a shotgun. Uh, and as we progress, we want to touch on the subject of denaturation because it's important. Imagine if you don't unravel the noodle, the enzyme cannot access it well, and so you won't get a very good digest. Now, after you have digested this protein, of course, you can shoot it into the mass spec directly, but perhaps you want to separate it with what we call a liquid chromatography. You have a machine that has able to push samples at very high pressure over a certain period of time. You have an analytical column 
that would then allow this peptides to bind according to their physical properties, hydrophobic or less hydrophobic, in a reverse phase mode. So reverse phase just means that the analytical column is very oily and it prefers to bind hydrophobic uh, analytes more than less hydrophobic ones. So what you have is a ranking system in that green peak. That is a typical chromatogram of a shotgun proteome peptide. You have the least hydrophobic coming out in the front, the left-hand side, and the most hydrophobic coming to the end. And moving on to the diagram where you see that little W with dots, red and green, right? That's the chromatogram. Shoot it into the MS right here. And then what you see is the signal, that mass to charge of the peptide. And if you fragment the peptide, you can sequence it. So that's the broad picture of how you will perform a typical proteomic experiment. All right, then after you have generated a peptide fragmentation spectra, right? you have the MS1, then you have the MS2. When you fragment proteins, we typically say we see either a B series y, uh, ion or Y series ion. Basically it's a sequence like so, according to its arrangement and uh, sequence as per its amide bonds. Now, of course, you don't know the identity of the protein by heart, right? Some people do, but you can't possibly know it for 10,000. You need to, uh, you need an aid. You need a database that tells you, okay, this spectra, I digest it in theory, in silico. All these fragments, I match it to my actual mass data. So how close is it? How confident I am in this case that it matches the fragments and the sequence coming from carmodulin? And it just does it in a very high throughput fashion for you. Typically, maybe a, an hour or half an hour worth of work, depending on the complexity of the spectra. You can also consider, instead of using just theoretical spectra digests, you can build your own spectral library because right now these B and Y ions are theoretically what the algorithm can predict for you. But perhaps for certain types of protein, there are certain B and Y ions that will be empirically detected, and perhaps the shorter ones, they're not are a confident match. So spectral library is the other way in which you can use to identify your protein and your peptides of interest. And now, another, to zoom a little bit out, what you can do in proteomics, in the end, the main point of this question is, is the protein high in my disease state or low in my disease state, for example? And this question can be addressed in a relative manner, right? I want to bring out this pointer here. In a very relative manner or in an absolute manner. We can debate the whole day about this, but relative simply means that you're gonna say, relative to the control, I have two, four, four increase. Mm -hmm. Relative, if it's absolute, for example, that means you have already spiked known amount of certain um, amino acids. You know exactly you have sort of a calibration curve and you can work it out, giving a, a unit, maybe in nano or microgram per mil or nano or microgram of protein matter. So that's the first distinction between relative and absolute quantification. Now you can choose to do it with labels or do it label free. Now, these are our choices, depending on what's the size of your sample um, and what's the question you're addressing right here. For label base, at best, you can use perhaps 32 or 64 different conditions that you wanna compare against. And these, these labels are not cheap because they're really good reagents. Now, label free comes into play when you actually are working on patient cohorts in hundreds or thousands uh, to have power to your data, right? For example, you add a treatment to a patient with perhaps atopic dermatitis, eczema, and those without. And now you want to quantify the proteome. Obviously, you're not going to make a judgment based on just five samples on each side. You want to have power. You want to extend it slowly but surely to the general population to really know if adding that drug 
alters the protein profile and has a consequence on that disease. So that's the choice you would make whether you use label or label-free quantification. So for today, uh, as I've mentioned in the very beginning of the slide, I would just like to cover label-free proteomics quantification because this is the question that Waters serves as part of our expertise. Now, one final idea about what you have to consider when you're embarking on a proteomic campaign, first of all, is that it doesn't mean that you have one gene being uh, transcribed, you get one protein. There is this um, difference. It's a non-linear equation, and it depends on the operon to the transcriptome, into the transcription. Now, you also have to consider that the protein will get modified after translation, it can get oxidized, it can deaminate it. And if you're very familiar with signaling pathways, right? for example, um, the most famous uh, cancer drug that I know right now that's antibody-based is Herceptin. And it interferes with the phosphorylation pathway into the cancer cell. So what happens is proteins upon a trigger will have a post-translation modification cause phosphorylation. And that's very transient, but that's very powerful. That's why, for example, when you drink coffee today, you feel a difference, you feel like a different person because of that, but just for a short time, all right? And then after that, you have to consider your sample complexity. Are you going to shoot one sample in one method or do you have to fractionate it to get depth of coverage? And of course, the most important big point is how big is your experiment? how much instrument time you need to get to the answer. So here is our solutions for label-free proteomics. So I will walk you back. First of all, from the sample preparation, we have a region called rapid gest. It is meant to efficiently digest protein um, because it is a very special denaturant. It's very compatible with protein digestion protocols. It improves the solubility of your proteins. And what it does is it doesn't inhibit the enzyme activity. So what you get is you reduce your digestion time. You also reduce the volume of your digests itself. And it doesn't, unlike some other denaturant, for example, urea, it doesn't cause protein modification. And it's very easy to remove. You just acidify your sample and then it was separate into its two base components and making it compatible with mass spec analyses. So the other uh, workflow, uh, the another, another consumable that we can possibly help you with is how do you recover your peptide when you're transferring from plastic containers throughout the entire process? We have very good vials and plates to help you recover all your hydrophobic peptides because they have what we call a max peak, high performance surface. And as you can see here, as if you were to use a conventional um, consumable, you can see reduced recovery over time, but with the max peak performance surfaces, regardless of how much you incubate your samples with, you do get most of the proteins, most of the peptides back. And for proteomics experiment, we have two liquid chromatography systems for you to consider. You have to wonder if you want to run it at nanoflow rates, so nanoliter per minute, or high nanoliter minute per minute, close to one microliter per minute, or you want to consider microflow, which means you run maybe 50 microliter per minute, 100 microliter per minute. These numbers might make might seem too much of a detail, but whether you run something at nanoliter per minute or microliter per minute would decide whether your samples are being acquired for 15 minutes or for two hours. Of course, the longer gradients will give you depth of coverage, and that you want to do for a very um, discovery experiment, a small and sharp experiment. But if you're going to run plasma cohorts, hundreds in size, you may not have the luxury of time to get maximum protein coverage. You might want to consider getting a middle, a mid protein coverage with all the proteins you want to see already, but at very fast chromatographic speeds. 
And on top of it, our chromatography system is also enabled with the max peak surfaces. In this case, we use the term premium for our chromatographic system. So it's just a quick way to, if you talk to Chrome Tech, I'm interested to know about your max peak surface. They'll ask you which one, is it the VI or the LC? You will say Acuity Premium. That's just a simple reference. Because it has this high performance surface, what you will do is you'll get extended coverage of your biomarkers, improved sensitivity, a reduced equilibration time. And I just wanna show you what that means for proteomics. So for example, this is a spectra on a conventional LC. What we did here is we digested a particular protein called alpha casein. This is a common protein that's used to test your LCMS system before putting your pressure sample onto the instrument. Now here we have one pico more on a column, which is very little. On a conventional LC, you cannot see this particular peak. This is the sequence of the peptide, and PS means phosphorylated serine. Because it's phosphorylated, remember, phosphorylation is a negative charge. And what max peak surface do is, in this case, it blocks the interaction of negatively charged analyte to a metallic surface. So let's roll it back a little bit. A liquid chromatography is a high pressure system. In order to take that pressure, it has to be a strong material, stainless steel. However, stainless steel, Fe as a group, is capable of being chelated by negatively charged analytes. Mm -hmm. Now that problem in, means that if your analyte has negatively charged, you would prefer to stay in the system, unwillingly drag itself across so you get a peak tailing then go to the mass spec, isn't it? With the max peak surfaces on our Acuity Premier liquid chromatography system, now when you have phosphorylated S, it pops up just like that. And if you have a problem seeing that detail with a different peptide belonging to alpha casein, you will now see this peak which you couldn't see before. And so we prove that this works with at least 22 peptides. In the nutshell, if you haven't seen that peptide, now you will get to see it. If you have seen that peptide and it has a negatively charged um, modification, you will get improvements to your signal. Okay, so uh, as a quick recap, you can choose between a nanoflow which is called the M-class, or a microflow, in this case, Acuity Premium. And then you can choose your detectors. In this case, we're gonna use so-called high resolution mass spectrometer. High resolution mass spectrometer means that every time you measure the mass of your analyte in Daltons, you get accurate mass in terms of decimal points, two or three more decimal points, all right? You can choose between our QTOS or our iron mobility enabled time of flights. And of course, this is just the hardware to make sense of all this data, you need powerful analytics. In this case, I will walk you through at the end, our Progenesis QI for proteomics to see, I get this beautiful spectra now, what is the identity of my proteins? But of course, there are a lot of open software out there, and I personally enjoy using Skyline a lot, which will also enable you to address a similar question. And of course, if you're doing small molecule omics only, then you can just change your LC hardware to a microflow liquid chromatography, which is the Acuity Premium. Up next, I will talk further about one particular quadrupole time of flight, our high resolution mass spec called the Zevo G3Q TOF. At this point, I'd like to take a little pause and I'd like to see the chat if there are any questions.
So I do not understand Bahasa, but I do not see any question marks in the chat group. So I'm going to assume that I'm good to carry on. I know Echo is on top of it. So if there's no question for the general perspective, then I believe I have Echo's blessing to proceed with the QTOF. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah. Thank you so much. But please feel free. I will echo to uh, echo echo to please type your questions in the chat freely okay. in whichever language you like to type in. Okay. Nah. So Bapak dan Ibu, silakan kalau ada pertanyaan bisa disampaikan pada kolom chat. Terima kasih. All right. So there was a broad concept on the considerations on what you will um, start to think about when you want to do proteomics. But one of the important hardware is a high resolution mass spec. And of course, on behalf of Waters, I speak for one of which, one of the models, the Zevo G3 QTOF. Now, this is an analytical workhorse that extends the simplicity and the range of molecule characterization. What it has is an extended mass calibration range up to 16,000 M by Z. It can enhance the sensitivity of label species. What that means, I'll show you in a little bit more detail. It has improved ion optics design. So it sends most of your ions into the mass spec and it has very comprehensive quantification capabilities in both targeted, the TOF MRM mode or the untargeted mode. Now, I wanted to first show you what it looks like if you were to slice this model into half. But at the same time, I want to share a fundamental concept that is universal for any mass spec. If you want to analyze anything in mass spec, as John Fenn, the inventor of ESI, electrospheric ionization said, you must give the analyte wings to fly. You must be able to charge it in whatever way, either charge it positively or negatively. And that's how it will be able, able to enter the mass spec in the first place to be detected. So a common concept when you talk to your mass spectrometry friend is what is the charge? What is the mass to charge of your analyte? And they'll tell you, yes, we can detect it or no, we have to tweak some workflows around it. So if this is a lot of information from you, the key take home message I would like you to know is for mass spectrometry, your analytes, we will always ask you, what is the mass to charge of your analytes of interest? Now, having labored that point a little bit more, here's why I took some time to explain it. Now, it has a specific architecture. Your analyte comes in this way, but why don't we just make it go in a straight line? Because the very fact is, what you want to look like will take a charge. So if those that do not have a charge, they will not be able to follow this beam. They will crash onto the surface or they will get pumped away. So those are the backgrounds that will interfere with your spectra and undesired. So with your charge and a light, what you will go through here is the step wave. It's an ion guide, yeah? And then it will go through a quadruple. That's therefore the Q. And then it will pass through a collision cell. This is where you turn on certain energy to fragment your analytes. And then you go back to the back to the analyzer. In this case, it's the time of flight because it's the time that the analyte takes that gives you its size. And of course, at a detector, the charge. All right. So here, the first feature I want to give you a little bit more insight into is why the set wave access an improvement on our Zero G3. Now I said that it has improved um, uh, features for label species. What do I mean? This is a series of analytes that is used as a benchmark for, for example, a HRMS. Now the blue is this previous version of the QTOF. When we introduce and modify the architecture of a step wave, we boost its signal significantly. So how do we do that? First of all, here, yet it's not super obvious. Instead of a typical ring orifice, a ring hole, it's shaped like a pear so that it can collect more ion cloud. And here, the next stage, it has horizontal plates. Before it was thinner, so what happened was that it generated more heat and it couldn't dissipate it well enough. 
And with the improved dissipation of heat, you will cook your analyte less. So there's in source, less in source fragmentation. And finally, with a segmented quadrupole at the back, you focus the iron beam much better because the iron beam, if you cannot control its shape well enough, it's going to splash all around the metallic surface, giving you iron burns. And that's not what you want. You want it to be as narrow and maximum transmission to the time of flight detector. So at the back end, at, you will see in, underneath the skin, there are certain lenses that we've put in place. So what it does is that well, most of the ions will go through the narrow hole in those focusing lenses. And what that does is that it can give you reproducibility and maximum what we call uptime for your instruments. If your ions hit the metallic surfaces over and over again, what happens if you follow the engineer when he opens up this baby is that they will actually have to remove the iron burn rings and help you restore the performance. So what we have improved is the focusing. So what happens is if you want to inject 576 injections over more than a week, the first spectra and the last spectra will maintain its intensity. As you can see the overlay between the green and the more obvious, the red spectra here. And the last concept for a mass spectrometer. Um, here, when you are acquiring data on a high resolution mass spec, you might have a question, do I use data independent acquisition or data dependent acquisition? So I'm gonna take a couple of slides to guide you through DDA, data dependent acquisition, or DIA, data independent acquisition. I wanna show you where is the difference and where you can make the choice when you want to start acquiring your data. So first, DDA, acquisition, LCMS. What happens is this is the chromatogram. All right, you have a separation of the analytes, the orange, the pink, the green and the red, and then you shoot it into the mass spectrometer. This is a schematic, but you recognize the quadrupole, collision cell, and the time of flight. Now, in this case, you have two peptides recorded in a survey mode. Survey mode means that there is no restriction. The quadruple just lets everything through, all right? That satisfy the mass and charge method definitions. All right, say so for proteomics, I want to acquire 200 mass to charge to 2,000 mass to charge because peptides are usually bigger, up to two to eight plus charges. My peptides can have up to eight charges. Mm -hmm. Now. And then it will first select after that when it has seen all the possible precursor unfragmented peptides. Mm -hmm. Now it will select the first, in this case, the red. The quadruple now only lets the red in, it will ignore everybody else. And what it will do is now this takes on an energy, the collision cell. And then what you get are fragments of the red, you see, measured in different details. So contrast that. Here you have only one point for the red. The moment you fragment it, you see much more peaks because of course you are sequencing the A, B, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, F of that peptide. Mm -hmm. And then the next microsecond, it will do the same, but for the green peptide. All right, so they are switching between the quadrupoles and collision energy. There was the, uh, a breakdown of what a mass spec does when you want to do data dependent or data directed analysis. Now in real life, the spectra and the chromatograms, first of all, the chromatograms are more complicated response according to retention time. You might have that all coming up at the same seconds. So what happens is, if you were to zoom in on this co-eluting peptides here, what you will get is many precursor ion intensity. So therefore the multicolors here. What it has to do for you, or you have to tell the machine, well, the machine cannot possibly select its quad for all the peptides that come in one time. You have to tell it, do I want a top one, top two, top 10, top five? So perhaps you told him, give me the five most intense peaks, yes? 
And what it does, it will ignore the purple and the black. Okay. So what you will have with this type of acquisition is that only the trees will get acquired. The grass will be ignored. And that little problem um, shows up if the proteins of interest, of your interest in this subject, is actually belonging to the grass, not the trees. The second problem with data-directed analysis, quantification. It's quite good for identifying the proteins of interest, but what if you need to quantify? When you want to quantify, you need enough data points along the chromatogram. So you have an intensity trigger here. Now in this bit, once it has been triggered, it's now remembering, remember it will select the core and then now your fragments. It won't have enough data points for the precursor. This is gone. And once it's collect enough data on the fragments, then it goes back to collect data on the precursor, the, the non-fragmented peptide. So this is not very suitable for quantification because you, you're not controlling this. This is what the machine takes on your behalf on, in microseconds. For example, your first injection of the same sample, it looks like this. A second injection could look like this. You have an element of chance. This is chance stochasticity. It's never exactly the, the same twice. So if your objective eventually is not just identification but quantification in a label-free mode, you might have a little problem. So for our uh, workflows, what we offer to you is not just data-dependent acquisition, but also data-independent acquisition if quantification is very important to you. And what it does in this case, in this schematic, is that now you have two precursor ions coming at about the same time. Fragmented, they fragment the A1 and B1, okay? And then you have the retention time. And what it does is that it will take this decision on your behalf. It wouldn't select for the precursor at all. Echo, if you are the host, can I trouble you to mute the audience for me? Because I can hear a background noise. Thank yeah, you so much. Uh, yeah. Appreciate it, no problem. And then so what happens is with the low energy, you will see the precursor. At the high energy, you will see the fragments. But you're not selecting for one or each in any microsecond. It's just doing instead this. So the same idea, the same hardware, but what happens is now, this is the one that's doing the work, not the quadrupole, but the collision energy, collision cell. You have, in this case, the pink and the gray ions coming in. You have low energy, that means there's no fragmentation. And you have high energy, which means you have fragmentation generating the spectra. And so all that is the work that is done is that you need the informatics to assign which fragments belong to the precursor. Now, of course, if you have co-isolation or co-illusion, then what we can do for you is to add on a refinement to the data independent acquisition process, which is called SONA. Now, then now we activate the quadruple. We ask the quadruple to just quickly scan over and over again. It's quite interesting. It's like a left hand, right hand doing different things kind of uh, exercise, you know, tapping your feet and rubbing your head. You have the collision energy going up and down, up and down your energy, but now the quadruple just goes through the target mass range in the background. Right now, this is about, you can set it to 15 Dalton or 28 Dalton as you decide, and it's super fast. So practically what happens now is, um, this is a model of how you can perform this data independent acquisition. This is sequential window, all, um, all ions acquisition, right? Now you have three precursor ions, the red, the green, and the purple. Now, if you, set static quadruple transmission windows. It just toggles like so. That's also a very good way to deconflict which fragment belongs to which precursor. But suppose now, if you have actually two ions that have very close precursor mass. So if you were to move it in predictable manner, like so, you have this window that captures both the green and the blue at the same time then the fragment spectra could be slightly complicated. Now, because SONAR is always scanning, 
you're not telling it when to move or how to move. You will always find a window that distinguish the green and the blue precursor ions in a very confident manner. So again, essentially, this is what's going on. You have the quadrupole transmitting, and you have the quadrupole exit on the precursor, giving you two distinct, distinct space in microseconds, where it only belongs to the green precursor ion, and later on belongs to the blue precursor ion. So SONA, on top of it, as a data independent acquisition, can help you increase confidence in your quantification. As a summary, data independent acquisition, in this case, MSE without the scanning quadruple, MS everything, and SONA gives you a digital snapshot of the data without bias to any uh, dynamic range of your sample. You get qualitative and quantitative data, data in the same injection and is reproducible and perfectly suited for label-free differential quantification. So at this stage, I would like to hand over the time to my colleague, Yingling, because now I have talked a lot about the mass spec, but we now have to roll ourselves back to a very important question before you shoot the sample in the mass spec. How do you prepare the sample in good time? So Yingling, I open the floor to you. Thank you, Yingling. Um, just before I start, uh, I just want to verify that everybody can hear me well. Yes. Yes, Yingling. Okay, that's great. So, um, Yenny, should I take the control from you or? Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so uh, my name is Yenling, <laughs> and I'm the chemistry specialist from Waters uh, Pacific. Now, um, I believe uh, Yen Ting has already talked a lot about the um, how do we do the detection, the QTOF, and with different functions that you can use in order to um, detect your proteins better with the equipment. Um, just like what she mentioned just now, I'd like to roll back a little bit in this section um, where I'll talk more on the, uh, the first part of the proteomics workflow that is on the sample preparation. So um, this slide is just here for us to refresh back on the... Uh, the uh, general proteomics workflow. Of course, uh, we start off with a protein, which uh, we want to digest it. But before we digest it, we would need to uh, denature it so that your trypsin can easily access to the protein strands and cut it up. And what we call the digestion uh, steps, all right, to turn it into smaller fragments of uh, predictable peptides before you actually shoot it into the system. Okay, for further detection. All right. So, um, of course, uh, just now Yen Ting mentioned about the shotgun proteomics, uh, or the bottoms up, uh, method. So I'm going to, uh, break it down into a few steps. Uh, the general steps that we do for the sample preparations of our protein samples. Of course, first of all, um, you want to do you want to do the denaturation. You want to denature the proteins, kind of loosen it up. Okay, so that it will be easier for your digestions uh, later on for the trypsin to come in and cut them into uh, fragments. Okay, and then number two, you want to do uh, reduction. Now, um, reduction, mainly uh, what this step does is that if you look at the first picture on the right, right, um, this is what reduction does to your protein. Basically, it helps to break the disulfide bridges between if you have a cysteine group in it. All right, so the cysteine group, they kind of form um, the bridges. So they it kind of, uh, we, and our aim is actually to loosen up the protein, right? So we need to break out, uh, to break these uh, disulfide bridges. So what happens is in the reduction step, uh, normally we'll add uh, reagents, for example, the DDT um, reagent into it so that we kind of break it up you see on the on the picture itself, it turns in uh, so that it can loosen up the strand more easily. All right. So once you have done, uh, you have, have loosened up it by breaking up the uh, 
uh, disulfide bridges, you move on to the next step that is on alkylation. Now, um, this kind of uh, disulfide bridges, right, it may not stay permanent that way once you have broken it up. What you need to do next is that you really, before going into the digestion, you need to make sure that the disulfide bridges do not form again. So how do we ensure that we add on this step that is the alkylation? So if you look at our, um, the second picture on the right-hand side, okay, that is the alkylation step. So what happens is um, on top of it, you see the, the, the first, uh, sorry, the second picture, but on the top part, you see that the disulfide bridges has already been broken down. Okay, so now what you want to do is you want to prevent the formation of uh, the formation of the bridges again. What you do is you add on some uh, alkyl chain to these um, sulfide groups. Okay, so you add on a chain to it in this reaction. So when you add on this um, this uh, chain to to the the sulfide group, it prevents the bridge to form again. So your chain remains loosened up for the digestion steps. Now, of course, once you have done the alkylation steps, you can move on to the next part, the most the, the important part that is the digestion steps. Okay, where you add in trypsins uh, to cleave your proteins into predictable uh, pe peptide uh, 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 fragments, which you will need to detect it later on in the instrument. Okay, um, and once you have done uh, uh you know, fragmenting the, the proteins into smaller peptide chains, then you want to stop the reaction. Uh, so we stop the reaction in the last step that is what we call the quench step. So in this step, we stop the uh, trypsin uh, activity, okay, so that we can have those, uh, we stop cutting those uh, uh, fragments into even smaller ones and we shoot them into the equipment for further analysis. Okay, so, um, sorry, I think back to that. Not done yet. Um, thank you. So for the reduction and alkylation steps, right? If you look at it, most of the time we are very concerned about it because the cysteine groups, but um it is these two steps, they are not always required, of course, um, depending on uh, the kind of proteins that you are looking at, uh uh, if there are uh cysteine groups in it where uh the disulfide bridges needs to be broken down. Okay, so next, please. Thank you. Now, I want to talk a little bit on um, water solution for this uh, sample preparation. We have what we call the uh, Protein Works Digest Kit. Now, what it is, it is an application kit for um, protein digestion. All right, so basically, it, it contains um, reagents um, to help you do the five steps that I've talked about just now. Now they contain free measured um, and log traceable reagents. What this means is that if you look at on the right hand side, you will see um, these bottles over here where they are already pre-weighed. Everything has been uh, weighed in a, in a certain amount for you. And also they are log traceable reagents. Okay, if anything, um, if there's anything uh, that we should check on, there's all we can always trace back to its uh, origin. Okay, so uh, next the end thing. Now, this pre together with these reagents that are pre measured, uh, we also have a very uh detailed um can use manual that comes with uh that comes with the purchase of the reagents. Now, in this reagent, uh, in this manual, what it does is uh, yeah, please next. <laughs> what it does is that this is just one snippet of uh the manual itself, what it does is it contains very detailed um, information on uh, uh, what is inside um, those bottles, how much of those, what is the amount of those reagents in those bottles. And of course, it also gives very clear and easy instructions on how to prepare um, these uh, uh, reagents. Like for example, on the right side, you can actually see just Reconstitute for the digestion buffer, you just have to reconstitute by adding 30 ml of water. So all these are step by step listed down for you, making your life easier, you know, in the midst of so many samples, right? All right. And of course, um, these uh 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 regions, they can be 
automated as well, which I will share a little bit more later on, all right, to increase the efficiency of your sample preparation. All right, so, um, sorry, Yenting, the, 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 the slide before. Okay, so just to give a little bit of idea of uh, what you get in this uh, protein works kit. Now, um, like I mentioned just now, the general ways, there are five ways, five steps of doing um, the digestion. Um, but of course, uh, reduction and alkylation may not always be required. I'm putting one example out here of what you will get in the protein works kit, the, the entire um, package of it. First of all, if you want to do a three steps, of course, you can see here, you have the denaturation step. Now, um, under the denaturation steps, we want to loosen up the um, protein itself. I think Yen Ting has uh, also mentioned about this uh, just now earlier in her presentation. Uh, what we has, uh, what we use for denaturation is this what we call the rapid-jazz surfactant because it's there to help um, us to loosen up and unfold the protein so that you get easier access for your trypsin to come in and cut the protein into smaller fragments. Um, I think it was also mentioned just now. Um, one of the main points of this effectant is that it's um it's compatible with your LCMS. You don't have to remove it, you know, right after using the 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 rapid jazz, you know, don't have to worry about removing them before the analysis because it's compatible with uh, LCMS. Um, it breaks down very easily after it's done its job. Okay, into um, non-interfering byproducts, so it doesn't um, uh, interfere with your analysis. All right. Then after we move into a digestion with the uh, uh, trypsin digestion, uh, where with the help of the rapid jazz uh, surfactant, um, you first of all you gain better access to to the strands itself. So this would mean what this means to us is that you get a faster digestion. So with the help of rapid jazz, you can actually complete your digestion in two hours time. All right. And once you're done uh, with the digestion, like I mentioned just now, you can just easily terminate the enzyme activity with just um, this quench reagent. Here we are using TFA, acetic acid, to quench it. All right. So next, please. Of course, uh, like I mentioned just now, uh, if you... Uh, so that is the three step. This would be the five steps uh, digestion kit where we also include the um, uh, the reduction and alkylation reagent in it. Uh, is it me? I think, uh, I think the words are not there, right? Can you see the wordings? Yeah, I can put it all out, I think. No problem. Yes, so uh, the kit would come in a two different uh in a variable of conf uh, variable uh, uh various configurations where you can actually um pick which one is most suitable for your current analysis. Okay, next please. Now, um, that is about digestion. Now, of course, we don't stop there. Um, what when you're doing your prote proteomics analysis, I think um, the sensitivity that is provided by your hardware is very important. But um, before going into your hardware, before shooting it into the equipment itself, um, I think uh, if we do better on the sample preparation, we will also be able to gain better sensitivity, better uh, if we do better cleanup. So cleanup is one of the things that we uh, should do if we want to achieve better specificity as well as sensitivity. So again, um, we have this uh, micro illusion SPE cleanup plates that uh, comes in uh, together with some of the protein works kit uh, configuration. Now, what is this uh, micro illusion uh, cleanup plate? Basically, it is a mixed mode uh, SPE. Now, normally, if we talk about uh, solid phase extraction, I think one of the most common uh, uh, chemistry that we would think about would be C18. I think that is the most common one. C18 falls under the reverse phase um, mode. Okay. 
Um, but in this case, we are combining two modes, the reverse phase modes, as well as a strong anion exchange mode, what we call the overseas MCX technology. So with this technology, we uh, it comes with an optimized and uh, of course, we also have already developed uh, a general protocol for the post-digestion peptide cleanup. So this method itself, it also comes um, uh, together in a manual when you chase the, um, uh, the micro illusion plate. So with this plate uh, and also the method combined, you should be able to get a cleaner uh, uh, um, sample before you put it into the system. Okay, so um, it gives high recoveries for tested on various triptych peptides, all right, um, as it helps to reduce the matrix effect um, cleaner. So therefore, it gives you um, uh, more sensitive, uh, better response peaks, better specificity. All right, so moving on. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this um, micro illusion plate. Um, design as this is uh, um, water's innovation. Now what happens is that if you look at um, the tip of it, right, you will see that the, the, the material, you know, on the right side, the tip on the right side, you will see that the material that we put in is actually in very small amount. If you look at it, um, it's only 2 mg per well. Now why do we do this? is because normally if you have a larger amount of uh, um, products in, in, in the well itself, you will retain a little bit, you will need more, you will retain more of those sample in it. And therefore you will need more, uh, a higher volume of illusion uh, reagent in order to push all your sample out at the end of the day. All right, but um, for us, we understand that uh, some samples may be very precious. You know, you probably don't have a lot of uh, uh, samples to begin with, or you probably only have a few hundred microliters to put it in uh, for the cleanup. And we don't want like, half of it to be stuck in the product itself, okay? Um, and you will need probably about one mil to elude it out. We want a smaller volume so that you maintain um, a good concentration for you to shoot in. So that will help with your sensitivity as well. All right, so anything next, please. All right, so what happens is this. This plate will allow a loading sample from 25 to 375 microliter. But I think um, the most important part is, is that for illusion, you can actually elude all of your samples in as little as 25 microliter. So imagine if you can put in 375 microliter of samples and at the, end, at the end of the day, uh, you elude with just 25 microliter. So that is like you are doing, um, it just automatically helps you to do a concentration of your samples. You don't have to do any evaporation. You put in 320, uh, 375 microliter um, and then you can just dilute it at the end of the day with just 25 microliter. So 15 times of concentration um, automatically. So how does it look on your peak? I'm going to show it to you. Yanting, next, please. So this is how it would look like. Now on this, um, so for the bottom, uh, bottom chromatogram, what you get is that uh, what we did is that we put in a 375 microliter of loading of samples, and then we finally elude it with a 375 microliter of uh, eluence uh, reagent. All right, so you don't get any uh, uh, concentration at all. But if you think you need that extra concentration, just because you need that extra sensitivity in your analysis, you can always do it like... Sorry, is that a question me. or? Uh, Mohon maaf, Ibu. Trouble. Bisa di mute dulu, Bu. Barangkali, terima kasih. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, where was I? Okay. Um, sorry, let me continue on the second point. Now, if you really need to have the extra um, concentration in your sample in order to boost your sensitivity, you can always do it the way you uh, 
that is being shown on the first chromatogram, the top part, where you actually put in 375 microliter and finally you elude it with 25 microliter. That will give you um, the 15 times response in, in your peak. So you see a, a better peak, um, um, a higher peak um, in the top chromatogram. Okay, that would be, of course, much better for your detection and your further analysis. All right, so next thing, thing thank you. All right, now I want to move on now. Just now I talk about how um, we can do the digestion part. Of course, I also introduced the protein works. Okay, now I want to talk about how we can further improve our efficiency, okay, of this digestion protocol, of course, using the protein works uh, workflow. Um, of course, at waters, our solution will be the protein works kit as well as the um, automation part. Um, so on the right hand side, um, this is actually um, uh, our pipetting robot. It's called the Andrew Plus. I will talk a little bit more and I will show you a video later on how it works. All right, just for better visualization. Now, um, next please. Now, to visualize um, this, how automation helps, I want to. Um, uh, and also protein works. I want to talk about this um, uh, particular um, workflow and uh, we have generated a few um, um, application notes on this. This is actually on the uh, uh, discovery for species specific gelatin uh, identification. I believe it's very important um, for us to, especially if you are doing, uh, for some of us, if you are doing the halal authentication, where we want to differentiate between the bovine species as well as the porcine species. So this is what we set out to do. Um, in this first uh, part of the application, what we do is that we, in order to do this speci species specific um, gelatin identification, what we did is that uh, we actually did this on a QTOF. What we do is that we try to identify the specific peptide biomarkers, okay? So specific to bovine as well as porcine species cause detection by um, HRMS QTOF. Now, what we have on the table below here is that we will manage um, by using, of course, the digestion protocol, we digest the proteins uh, that is found in the gelatin itself. And we manage to get a few fragmentations of the, a few peptide fragments that is specific to the bovine as well as porcine itself. So next, please. And what we do next is that we bring even further, uh, uh, we, do, uh, we, we take a step further, that is we try to increase the efficiency of the sample preparation by including uh, our protein works using the Andrew Plus pipetting robot for this um, same analysis, but now, um, we are done with the discovery of the peptide fragments. What we do now is we try to bring it into routine analysis. So for this, uh, we do it on a TQ uh, triple quad MS detection and we do quantitation as well with the fragment that we have found. Okay, so next please. Now, I want to share a little bit about what we, what is uh, the entire workflow of the protein works, you know, we talk about those five steps. How is it being done? How, what do we add and uh, if we need to heat it? Now, if you look at on the left side over here, you can actually see that these are the five steps. Um, um, so uh, this is a three-step protein works, but in total, you see a five steps here. Of course, you start off with a pre-treatment where you add the gelatin standards and samples into the buffer, and then you heat it for 80 degrees Celsius. So, in a digestion protocol, there will be a lot of heating and also incubation. So different temperatures needs to be used for um, this digestion protocol. Second, you have the uh, uh, denaturation part, okay, where you add uh, the, uh, the buffer in it. And after that, you add in 12 microliter of the rapid gas surfactant. And then you mix it mix the solution, and then you denature it at 80 degrees Celsius. Now, so um, the combination of rapid jets as well as the, temp the high temperature uh, enables us to, to denature the protein in a very short time, just 10 minutes. So we need the heat 
in order to reduce our time of the denaturation. So again, 80 degrees over here. And then the next part, you see there is a digestion part. This is the part where we add in our trypsin solution. Now we know that trypsin works in, a, in trypsin needs to have a certain temperature in order to work well. That's, that's around 45 degrees Celsius, 40, 45 degrees Celsius. So again, a temperature is needed over here and it's two hours. Uh, so the waiting time, if we are doing it manually on our own, we probably uh, uh, can put it there, you know, that two hours, you probably can do something else, but you probably, you know, two hours may not be long enough for you to do other things. You probably just sit waiting over there. So there's waiting, there's a lot of waiting. There's also a lot of temperature adjustment if you're using a heating block. And lastly, after the digestion, of course, uh, we'll add in three microliter for the quench, the three microliter um, TFA for the quench, okay, mix the solution. And again, we need to incubate it for an additional 15 minutes at 45 degrees Celsius. Now, if you look at it, um, there's a lot of uh, waiting time and also there's a lot of temperature adjustment over here. Now, this is where automation can come in to make our life easier. Now, uh, just now I mentioned about the Andrew Plus Piper Thing robot. I think um, the name itself um, tells us that it helps us to do um, Piper Thing. But uh, yes, it helps us to do Piper Thing. It's a liquid handler. But uh, I just want to add on also here that it doesn't, it doesn't just help us with um, the Piper Thing part itself. It also helps us to automate the temperature changes uh, and also adjustment that we need, okay, so that we can actually fully automate this protocol. So uh, with the help of other accessories like the Peltier Plus on the right side, right side you can see over here, um, this is here to help us to regulate the temperature, okay, so that we can change from 80 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius easily. Um, unlike those um, heating block where it's a passive heating and passive cooling, uh, sorry, not passive heating, passive cooling itself. So when you bring it down to 80 degrees to 45 degrees, it will take you a very long time. Okay, so next please. Now, um, so of course, uh, it uh, when it comes to automation, definitely it helps us to uh, uh, do all the piping and then help us to complete the protocol without us having to do it ourselves. So it reduces a lot of the manual parts and therefore it helps to... Um, reduce on our human error as well. But another thing that I want to talk about is also, um, I want to drill down a bit more will be on time. Um, so here we actually did um, a simple test on it where we can actually, if you have a lot of samples, we can actually complete um, about 90 samples in about five hours, about six hours time. So that's pretty fast comp uh, with all the piping that needs to be done as well as adding in the two hours for the digestion part. Okay, so basically all the piper thing can be done in about three hours and 40 minutes. So that's pretty fast. All right. So I think I've talked um, a lot on uh, you know how automation can help. I think it would be better if we can actually uh, visualize on how it works. So I have a video over here to show you all on how this uh, protein works um, uh, how the workflow, how it works. Uh, yeah, and then it's going to help us to play. So again, if you cannot hear the music, please let us know. May I verify if there's any sound? Yes. Yes, anything.
okay. Yes. Okay, so um, I have a few slides uh, left and I want to end this um, at my presentation on um, giving a simple summary on the automation and the protein works flow uh, for the protein digestion. So I hope the video just now gives you a better uh, visualization on how um, this combination can help increase um, efficiency as well as uh, how it helps you to save time in terms of doing um, your digestion if you have a lot of samples to begin with. Um, so um, I just want to end with these three points over here with this com uh, with combination of automation as protein works uh, workflow. It's simple, it's time saving as well as quality. I'll elaborate them um, one by one. First one, please. All right, so simple. Like I mentioned just now, um, protein works kit come in pre-measured regions. Um, next, please. And also it comes with a manual for step-by-step um, -step region preparation. So you don't have to worry too much about where, uh, weighing yourself, okay, or or even, you know, making a mistake in, in, in between of it. This will definitely help us to reduce on the human error itself because there's less intervention. All right, next please. Of course, um, the next one will be time saving, the helps of uh, um, automation as well as the rapid gest um, surfactant, which is compatible with um, the MS. Uh, we save a lot of time on that. So basically from pre-treatment all the way to injections, um, we are taking, uh, we are doing it in less than three hours. Of course, this depends on how many samples you have. As I've mentioned just now, if you're doing about 90 samples, that will take you about, with all the pipetting work, it will take you about five hours and 40 minutes. So this will allow for a same day sample preparation and a same day analysis itself. Um, it brings down um, the amount of time that you need to spend on your analysis. It gives you it time, it saves your time and gives you higher throughput at the same time. All right. And next, um, I want to talk a little bit about this that is on the quality of uh, our reagents. Um, all the reagents that you purchase, especially the trypsin um, from water comes with a certificate of analysis. Now, these are lot traceable regions. That means if there's anything um, that is not right about it, um, you're always guaranteed a warranty within the period itself. And um, of course, um, the way we do it is also we manufacture it ourselves, we prepare it as well on our own um, at our ISO 9001 facility. So what does this mean uh, when I say the quality itself? How does it work is that... Um, it's being prepared in a controlled facility, which means um, you don't have to worry. Every batch of the reagent that you get from us will give you the same reproducibility, the same repeatability. You can be assured of that. All right. So I think this is the last point uh, for my side. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, probably you can also put it in, in the chat. I will check on it while I pass back uh, the floor to Yen Ting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yingling. And I just want to check if you still hear me well. Yes, I yes, see yes. That, uh, Thank you. I see that uh, questions in the chat, which I'm very excited about. But now I just want to finish off by sharing first the applications and keep the questions coming. And thereafter, we'll wrap it up with good time to address all the questions that you might have felt throughout these uh, conversations. So how do you apply the concepts and the workflow that we have to share. Now, uh, as I mentioned, historically, you will use Nanoflow for high coverage of proteins. However, if you have more uh, scale and increase in sample sizes, you want to consider microflow uh, methods. And if it's appropriate, you want a single LCMS system that can suit 
multi-omics experiment. So you are acquiring for proteomics and a simple switch order method allows you to see the metabolome and the lipidome at the same time. I want to give you an example on how such an exercise can be carried out. This is a proteomics experiment on a microflow method. This is analyzing cohorts of uh, plasma coming from four different conditions. Well, critically, three con conditions, the healthy, the asthmatic, and the COP. And of course, we take poor quality control plasma from all of them so that we can inject it at regular intervals to make sure that the hardware and acquisition is going well before further injecting the next series of samples. In this experiment, we play around with the time. We had a 15 minute, a 30 minute, and a 45 minutes gradient. And as you can tell, one to 40%, this means this is a reverse phase chromatography acquired on the quadruple time of light in sonar mode. And with that, this is the software that we put the spectras through. Progenesis QI for proteomics, I want to take you a little bit more detail. Spectronaut is a software by Bionoxis, whereby you can use spectral libraries to match your data. So we want to show you the options available. So first of all, when you have the data, you want to see on a global level, what are the proteins you can find? This is a principal component analysis, not, uh, yes, you can see these are dots, dots by the sample, but also each of the gray is the protein ID number. Here you can see P's and Q's. The first indication that this is coming from a Uniprot database, quite well curated, of course, from the human proteome. The coefficient of variation, across all the samples are pretty good, including the QC critically so. And here's the result, a broad comparison on the protein coverage you get between different gradient times, 15, 30, and 45, We're between different types of protein loadings, five microgram, 10 microgram. Of course, the longer you run, the more you add to a certain limit, the improvement you'll get in your proteome coverage. But however, if you want to compromise being in the interest of time, you can use a 30 minute gradient with 10 microgram loading of proteins. Now, if you want to load this spectra into progenesis QI for proteomics, this is the workflow acquired on a mass spec, either by MSE for everything, SONA with a scanning quad, HDMSE means you have eye mobility. This is a subject for a different time. And then after that, you will perform um, first, an alignment of your data across all the sample data sets first, because it's label-free proteomics. After that, then you can do the stat statistics of the analysis, multivariate analysis, how well is the QC, how well are the separation of the control. And finally, that's the biggest part of the equation. What pathways are affected as a result of these different show changes in the conditions? Now, the workflows between proteomics and metabolomics are very similar. The only difference, as you can see, see here, is the position on when you perform the identification. Now, for metabolomics, you will use the mass to charge to first identify what are the key mass to charge uh, difference in the samples before identifying that compound. For proteomics, recall, there is essentially identifying peptides first that belongs to perhaps many peptides belong to one protein so what we do is a roll up straight to a protein match via the peptide spectrum match before performing the statistics otherwise preceding this differences the workflow is very similar and what you want as i reiterate is a relative full change between in this case the copd patients versus the control or the asthmatic patients versus the control, of course, with mean and variance. Now, what's good about Progenesis QI is that it welcomes many data formats across the vendors. The most universal format, you can also convert them into what we call an MZML or MZXML files from the various vendor, or you can load the raw from SciX, Thermo, or Agilent. Now, here I want to spend a little bit of time. For example, if you have the spectra this is the first look you will get. Of course, in this case, there are three conditions, A, B, C. 
Yes. And they look like, what are these dots, right? So first here, I'll rem remember we talked about MSE, right? The working collision cell. You have the low energy, which is the MS1. The moment you fragment it with high energy, this area pops up, of course, because you start to get smaller species, in this case, VNY ions. And here, this is a plot of the mass to charge over time, a 2D diagram. So here, in this case, this I decide that it will be my reference chromatogram to perform an alignment. And what happens is these are the steps that you can use by default for pick picking. And critically, you will need to tell the um, data, which is the reference data set. And the quantification method, and you'll perform this processing from importing runs, selecting the reference vector runs, and creating the design back up to protein quantification for you. And I went through quickly because I actually want to show you what is essentially happening when we're trying to align peaks from label-free proteomics. Okay, here you have a spectra um, replicate one from the condition A, replicate two from condition A. So the green and the purple. Now, essentially, when you have a peptide spectra, it looks a little bit like arrow hits, like an arrow like that. Why? Because the first peak is the monoisotopic peak. All of them have C12s, just for example, because we live on Earth. And then the next one, which is about maybe half height or a little less, depending on the natural abundance of C13, is a peak, the, the M, M plus one peak, because we assume you have uh, a chance of having one C13 or one N15. And then the next peak will be any of the combinations, so on and so forth. It gets smaller and smaller. So the first two peaks for peptide, uh, peptidomics and proteomics are the ones you use for quantification. That's why you get this natural spectral pattern when you try to look at it from the mass spec to retention time. Now, if you were to align the A01 and A02, right? For example, in terms of retention time here, the difference is only about less than half a second, right? 40.5 within here. What you want to do is to bring them closer together because the chromatography is good, but there will always be what we call slight chromatographic shifts. You want to stack them on top of each other. So then what you can do for quantification is very reliable based on this retention time window. So what happens is before alignment, after alignment, it will now align the replicate two according to replicate one, and it will do iteratively so for all the other samples. So again, why is that super important? When you do label-free quantification in any combination, what happens is this. This is, for example, again, replicate one, replicate two, right? It, well, actually, I would say, condition A and condition B. Between replicates, I hope for less of a difference. I hope you have more robustness than this. So condition A and condition B, right? This peak is present in condition A, absent in condition B, because maybe truly this condition reduce the detection of this peptide. Now the problem happens when, for example, it tries to take this intensity and divide by this condition. What you'll get is infinity. And therefore, this protein ID and this peptide ID drops out of your radar. It cannot make sense of it. This is called missing data. So what happens in label-free quantification as a concept is you need to pick the peaks for co-detection and build a composite of where are the areas to try to integrate a peak, no matter how low it is, to reduce the number of missing values. So this is what the algorithm will do. Once you have aligned it nicely, pick all this area for both conditions throughout. And so that's the concept that I want to critically share with you uh, for label-free proteomics, why alignment is important, and you need a software that can manage this for you. Next, the other component that you need in the software is a good way to put the database. Uh, in this case, I, I could recommend, for example, the Uniprot database, or you can um, it depends on, first of all, the acquisition mode. All right. So if you're doing data-dependent acquisition, you can use a uh, mascot, which allows you to populate all the available publicly sequences in the backend. 
Now, if you're doing MSE or SONAR, you can pair it to our PLGS server, Protein Links Global Server, which will handle, again, the MSE spectra for you for the identification. So you simply choose it right here, like so. And then you can also build and export your own libraries from Progenesis ID, no problem, especially if you want to build spectra libraries. You can use standard format libraries from NIST or even from Swarth Atlas. This is probably a SciX based Atlas and use that as the alternative uh, spectral library for matching. Now, the next expect you want to be able to see is how did my runs go individually and globally? Now, distinct from uh, metabolomics workflow, as I've mentioned, right? You'll first do protein IDs before doing a statistical analysis. Here, okay, here we're doing all the stats by MS and by Z first. I want to bring your attention critically to this um, dot plot here. This is the mass error over M by Z. Because for every peptide, you have a theoretical M by Z. And in your spectra, you might deviate by a certain and what we call parts per million, how many decimal place by two decimal place, three decimal place, or by units. By units, that's critical. Then it's not high resolution mass spec anymore. But what you want is, for example, for large proteins and peptides, you will set your peptide tolerance. You can set from a 10 range of 10 ppm to 30 ppm, right? And it can be below or above the expected target M by Z. Now, if you see perhaps day one, you started running like 10 or 20 samples. Now Friday comes. And when you look at this quality control, it starts to shift left or right massively beyond your set point of 20 ppm. You might say, okay, guys, I think we need to stop the runs now. We need to take a look at the LCMS. Did the calibration fail? Is there a problem with the LC drift time? You're going to look at the quality control samples. So this gives you a quick way to analyze daily and weekly quality control because either it's inherent to the sample, and hopefully that's a small fraction of your hundreds of samples, or you might have to rerun it to improve the acquisition because otherwise you'll get a bias for the samples that were run that day. You have to distinguish whether it's inherent to the sample or it's a machine error or a machine issue. Then after that, for the statistics, again, you get to reduce all that complicated data into a simple principal component analysis. And you get to also see the standardized expression profiles. Here, you get a good separation of the three conditions, A, B, C. And you can also add labels and start tagging interesting proteins of interest in this particular experiment cohort. Of course, when you need to go deeper into the data, any proteomic experiment should allow you to see what's the ascension number, what are the peptide counts, what are the differences, and the description, and allow you to have both the protein and the peptide view, eventually leading to the original spectra. And of course, uh, this is a discussion for a different time. I just want to ex explain to you, for example, if you are dealing with silex, whereby in this case, you are feeding the cells with heavy label amino acids instead of doing label free. Uh, this you do for a small amount experiment, but it can give you the advantage is that once you label, for example, condition A with a heavy label one and heavy label two, very quickly you can combine the samples into a single sample preparation. So you get less variation from dealing with individual separation. If you were to do the SPE in separate wells, put them into separate uh, acquisition plates and so on and so forth, you are essentially acquiring them at the same time through the mass spec. So that's the advantage if you were to do silex. But I think the maximum number of conditions you can put right now is either six or eight. So a very sharp and critical experiment, probably binary comparison. And to the last bit, once you have found the proteins of interest, to make sense of it, I mean, so you're probably going to see a lot of albumin, a lot of like uh, serum proteins or a lot of heat shock proteins. They can be noise, but some of them can be meaningfully grouped into pathways because the more that particular pathway is put up, the more likely is this genetic mutation affecting that pathway of interest. Whether it's causal or um, correlating is a different story altogether. But what you can do from progenesis QI is to tell it, do I want to export it for, prepare it for Metacore? This is a solution from 
clever rate? Do I want to export it for in a format for ingenuity? This is from Kaijan. Impala, which is free. Penta, which is free. All base. Uh, this is the a diagram you get from the CAC pathway. And this is simply the, the format. What is the differential and what are the genes of interest? To help you make sense of your experiment. And so, for example, if you had the privilege of trying out Matacore, you can get, uh, have a chat with us and we can perhaps assist you in this journey together as you try to understand the pathways. And as a quick summary, I hope from today's session, you can see our full end-to-end -end solution from the sample prep to the informatics. We have very good LC that offers you ultimate separation of performance, both from nanoflow to microflow. Consider data independent acquisitions if you're going for quantification. Uh, and of course, if you have sample from low to medium uh, protein complexity, we also have Informatics workflow that can help you interface with other softwares or public softwares across both metabolomics and proteomics. And our plugins would help you do the pathway analysis. So I thank you so much for your time. And it will please me so much if you can give us your feedback via this QR code. Please take your time. And at this juncture, I hand over back the time to Echo and I will look forward to your chat questions. Thank you. Super and fantastic. Thank you so much, Yan Ting and Yin Ling, uh, for the session and sharing. We uh, have learned a lot from both of you. So, uh, bagi Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, mohon kesediaannya untuk berpartisipasi, memberikan feedback dengan cara mengisi uh, survei um, dengan men-scan QR code yang tertera pada layar Zoom pada saat ini. Mohon kesediaannya Bapak dan Ibu untuk mengisi survei tersebut. So, um, Echo, I will read back one question that... Uh, oh, Ibu yeah. Tree... Sorry for that. Yeah. yeah. No problem. So, yeah, um... we have one question from Ibu Tri. Uh, do you want me to read it for you? Yes, thank you so much. All right. No problem. So, we have question from um, Ibu Tri... Uh, The question is, thank you for the uh, excellent lectures. I have several questions. First, in the protein identification, how many peptides minimum we should have in order to determine uh, to a certain protein? If we only have a single peptide identified, but it contains the unique sequence of a certain protein, will it sufficient or not? The second question is during the protein isolation, sometimes we use salt precipitation or then fractionation using salt uh, buffer. Would it be effective for the digestion or not? The third question is for the peptide markers, it is already uh, included in the kit or we just add a known, uh, a known protein. Thank you, Yanting. Yes. And I see there's also a question for you, Lin and Sai. So I'll, I'll take it yeah. um, step by step. Great yeah, question. Sure. Thank you, Ibu Tree. And uh, Ibu Tree, if you're on the um, call, I, I might ask you for more details for the third question. The question number one, is one peptide enough uh, to allow you to identify a protein? I would say yes. If it's a very confident peptide identifier, I think we've shown you spectra as well, whereby you have fragments of the B and the Y ion series. So, I don't have a good picture, but just follow my voice and my hands. We have the sequence, maybe the sequence is called um, uh, peptide, P-E-P-T-I-D-E. -E. And then when you fragment it, you want to have as many B, that ion series that reads as P-E-P, P-E-P-T-I, and P all the way, and the reverse. If you have a lot of these fragments, even if you have only one peptide sequence, you are super confident that this is it, this is enough for you to say, I have this protein in this sample. This is a scenario whereby you're trying to do as much ID as possible. But the moment you want to do more targeting processes, then I would recommend devoting more time to only targeting another second peptide coming from the same sequence. Of course, if it's the only unique sequence that can help you distinguish 
between the other proteins, then yes, you have to stick to that one peptide. But I would say this scenario must be specific for maybe heat shock proteins that have very high um, sequence homology, as opposed to, for example, distinguishing pro possibly maybe a receptor tyrosine from a nucleic, nucleic acid-based protein. There you will find more differences and definitely more peptides to support whether you identify a surface protein or endonucleic protein. That's number one. Number two, yes, I'm aware that for protein um, sample prep, often there is like a protein crash. You have the sample, it is mix of lipids, metabolome, uh, metabolome uh, lights, sorry, metabolites and proteins. And then if you add um, salt precipitation, some people use acetone precipitation as well, right? They would take out this, um, they'll leave it overnight, and then you spin it down, you get a pellet at the bottom, and then you clean it up. And then you do, in this case, you do the, the fractionation of the protein before you um, send it for the mass spectrometry. So I would say, if you need to do a protein crash, what we do is we actually don't fractionate at the protein level. We would actually uh, crash the whole protein out as a pellet, maybe give it a bit of a wash, just because actually we won't even wash it. We would crash it with acetone nitrile, or actually no, acetone, acetone, and then spin it down, remove the supernatant. Then you can add all the enzymes you want, and then after that, you go back into the solution. And if you want to fractionate at that point, you fractionate by the peptides and not the proteins. So that's one. But now I want to invite Yingling on to the, into addressing this question because rapid jazz can help you avoid the salt precipitation step. Yingling, do you have a comment on that? Okay, I think uh, this salt precipitation, right? Um, I agree with what you mentioned just now, the crashing out using the um, acetone. Acetone. Um, oh, okay, acetone. Yeah. So nitrile. Um with the rapid jazz, um rapid jazz main function I would say is to uh loosen up the protein so that we can get more access into the uh um the trypsin to get more uh, access into it. But for this um question, I'm not sure if uh, uh you would like I mean Ibu tree. I'm not sure if you would like to do like an untargeted one or a targeted one where, because from, me, from what I understand, salt presentation is basically when you want to, uh, it's based on the aqueous um, solubility of the protein, right? When you do the fractionation of it. If you, if you would like to do an untargeted one, then I would say, you know, uh, probably you can just uh you, you would like want to get as much protein as possible to go into the digestion, but if you want to go by, uh uh the 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 solubility of it probably that's another story. I'm not sure if you agree on that. Mm -hmm. There's a good perspective. So I would say that if you prefer salt crash or organic um solvent crash then basically it, it should, the crash itself, after you remove the supernatant, you put the enzyme in to totally digest it. You will never be able to reconstitute that protein fully until the enzyme has does, done its job. And that's like an overnight incubation. So okay. it's a traditional way, it's long. Whereas if you don't do the protein precipitation, then you can start the digestion straight away after you add the denaturation. I think I heard echo your voice. Do you yeah. want to say something as well? Yeah, we just received comment from Ibu Tree. Um, we do not, uh, we do non-targeted study. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And then finally, um, Ibu Tree, right? If you don't mind, can you help me understand the third question better? For peptide markers, it is already included in the kit, or do we add an, a known protein? Can you explain this um, question to me further? If it's convenient for you to unmute yourself, or you can type it in. So in England, Pepta mentioned about it. Okay, I may, I I'm wondering, are you referring to the gelatin 
peptide markers, for example. No, sorry, because I am in the middle of the another meeting, so that's why I cannot open my mic here. Yeah. That's okay. So it's not the gelatin analysis, peptide. If you guide me here, yeah. Is it here? You can you can tell me to stop. Um, peptide markers. I think before this, yeah. Before this, okay, let me go before this. Peptide markers. This one, this one. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry. Oh, oh no, oh, I, I see what you mean. Mm. This just this means that your protein has become peptides. Oh, okay, um, okay, not, okay, okay. Not, okay. Yeah, sorry. yeah I, I get you now. We, we just mean that the markers, the peptide markers for each protein will be generated in short uh, peptides. Um, yeah. But if you need to, uh, the old, so yeah, I, I hope that's very clear now. I actually went to the gelatin bit because I thought if you want to quantify, for example, you know, you have markers that tells you it's between one species or the other straight away. And now you want to know how much in terms of um, make or nanogram is there in the sample. Yes, you will spike peptide markers or do a calibration curve. You either do it not within the sample, so you do an external calibration curve and give and allow you to extrapolate back the intensity to the quantification or your markers are heavy labeled. Then you put it inside. And if you want to, if it was actually a label protein, you can edit and digest it all together. So that would be my um, re, uh, interpretation of the question uh, if I had to um, address it that way. And I see there are more. Yes, no problem. Thank you so much. So I think we are almost at the top of the hour, Echo. Yes, yes, feel? we are. Yeah, I think um, if there's no further question, uh, but however, we are still expecting some another question. <laughs> okay, so if there's no more question, I have one question for you, Yanting, actually. Yes, do you mind yeah. giving me a second? I would like to invite again the customers and the audience here. Yeah, sure. If you don't sure. mind, please give me your feedback. I would really uh, read through them and take that material to see how I can improve for the next uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Now, Echo, bring me your challenge. <laughs> All right. I have one question. So you have explained about DIA or data independent acquisition. Yes. This one offers um, greater uh, reproducibility and sensitivity and then also dynamic range compared with data dependent acquisition or DDA. However, I believe that the data analysis using HRMS is complex and often requires expert knowledge when dealing with the large scale data sets. So do you have some tips or tricks can be shared to the participants and audience today on how to overcome the challenges when we're performing that anal analysis using the uh, DIA method. Thank you so much. Sure. So for DIA methods, the Progenesis QI for proteomic software will help you uh, access this data easily. Mm -hmm. As I've shown, um, yeah. the, we actually have a very good guide online whereby you can type the question and find answers to this mm -hmm. step. But of course, I know if you're playing with a game or software for the first time, right, it's quite intimidating. So yeah. what happens is that if you're curious about the software, you can inquire with us. We can give you a trial, uh, a free trial a license whereby you actually have data that you want to test it out with. Mm. And if you have inquiries, you can also ask both myself, my team, or even Chrome Tech's team to guide you through the certain step on how to process the data to unlock it. If you don't have data, packaged with the Progenesis QI for Protomix are actually mm -hmm. ready to go data that you can play around with. So if you don't have a mass spec, no worries. We have a data for you to start the processing progress. 
of course, if you are as actually going to purchase an MS, we have a very good training uh, program that can help you use progenesis within the first week of training. So no issues at all, regardless of whether you care or do not care about mass spec in the first place. Thank wow, you. Super. Thank you so much for the answer and explanation, Yanting. I think we are already now uh, 11.31. So I guess uh, we can um, finish all the sessions today. So terima kasih banyak kepada Bapak dan Ibu sekalian yang sudah meluangkan waktu berpartisipasi dalam memeriahkan um, kuliah metabolomik ke-35 yang diselenggarakan oleh Forum Metabolomic Indonesia. So again, thank you so much for our speaker, Yan Ting and Yin Ling. So hope to see you guys again in another event. So terima kasih banyak sekali lagi Bapak dan Ibu. Kita akhiri saja kesempatan pada hari ini. Semoga uh, kita selalu diberikan kemudahan, kelanya, dan uh, kesehatan selalu. Dari kami, uh, sebagai tim from Techindo Utama, selalu siap untuk membantu Bapak dan Ibu sekalian uh, terkait uh, implementasi aplikasi tentang LCMS ataupun HRMS. Kami punya tim di Chrome Tech Indo Utama yang akan selalu siap bantu Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Saya kembalikan lagi kepada host kita pada hari ini, kepada Ibu Dewi atau... Ibu Alfi. Oh, Ibu Alfi, sorry ya. Saya kembalikan kepada host, yaitu Ibu Dewi atau Ibu Alfi. Terima kasih sekali lagi. Okay. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. <laughs> saya, saya kira Sorry. mungkin uh, seperti itu aja. Uh, Mariko, terima kasih untuk uh, kesediaannya ya me mengisi acara forum metabolomik ini. Ya. Sama-sama Pak Rudi. <laughs> ya, itu saja. <laughs> Sorry masih nampaknya masih apa sih sedikit ini setelahnya mungkin mudah-mudahan ke, ke depan kita bisa Uh, lebih baik lagi, tapi menarik baik. sekali tadi ininya presentasinya. <laughs> baik Pak, terima kasih. Oke okay, oke, okay. terima kasih. Saya kira uh, mungkin itu saja uh, untuk acara ini. Mungkin kita bisa bertemu lagi di uh, acara forum metabolik berikutnya. Uh, okay. Saya tutup saja. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, ya. Sampai jumpa lagi. Ya jumpa lagi. <laughs> ya. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, thank you. Uh, bye.